it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I'd like to dedicate uh, this presentation today <clears throat> to the educators and the parents in the audience, because as I uh, have struggled in the last three years with the subject of creativity, I've lived it my whole life, and I haven't been able to explain it or define it or articulate the sources of it. So since joining uh, University of California at San Diego, I uh, have been doing some very introspective work on creativity, and this is what I've come up with. And I'm going to take you through a journey of the sequence of events. And I, I, I have to use the quote by Winston Churchill, who once said, play the game for more than you can afford to lose, for only then do you learn the game. And for myself, I am only creative when I go out at the end of a branch of a tree and perch myself precariously for a fall. If I'm hugging the trunk, nothing. If I'm standing on the ground, even less. And so I want to go through this little journey to, to help explain uh, sources of creativity. And we're going to go a, a global around the world and start in Hawaii and end up in Hawaii. And I'd like to start with uh, Midway, uh, as it was alluded to. I, I first moved to Midway when I was seven. <clears throat> and I was initially fearful because uh, I was afraid. It was only the highest elevation on the island is 10 feet. What was going to protect me? And my parents said, there is a barrier reef that would protect us as long as we stayed inside the reef. Remember that throughout this conversation. So it's 1,200 acres. It's uh, the distance from the Big Island out to Midway is the equivalent of New Orleans to Las Vegas. It is the second oldest island in the archipelago. And obviously it's beautiful, but three quarters of the island was restricted because of leftover live ammunition from World War II and two runways that dissected the island. So you can guess where I played. <laughs> and, and these were my toys. <laughs> and it was at the age of seven when I first experienced that ever so sweet nectar of adrenaline <laughs> when I found my first live M1 bullet head, um, bullet left over from World War II. And even better yet, I learned how to disarm it. But it was also marine and bird sanctuary where over three million birds nest and mate during the seasons. And it was an island where, inverse to the rest of the world, being a marine sanctuary, the fish life and the bird life had precedence over humans. So I was raised upside down, as many people will attest. <laughs> but at the same time, what was a very pronounced thing, just to give you an idea where Midway is, right next to the International Dateline, and if I ever meet Sarah Palin, I'm going to say, from my front porch, I could see tomorrow. But on Midway, there developed the, my competitive spirit. And in that competitive spirit was the ability to be the first one on the beach in the morning to find a glass fishbowl. A glass fishbowl was, was recycled from sake uh, bottles, hand-blown. They would go in the fishing nets of the Japanese fleet. They would depart from Japan and then go through the Pacific Gyre and spin in the ocean for decades. But in order to land in Midway, they had to thread the eye of the needle after this long journey because they couldn't come in over the reef. But one day, after searching, 
I found one. And when you find a fishbowl on Midway, it's like l winning the lottery. And people say it was a one in a billion chance. And that's what drove me every day. I woke up every morning thinking one in a billion was going to happen this morning. So later in life, when people would say, that's a one in a million chance, slam dunk. <laughs> I'm serious. So Medway was very pronounced until my mother outdid me. <laughs> she went out on a skiff one morning with my Calabash uncles, went out to the reef, and they were sitting on the reef. It was the largest fishbowl that had ever been found on Midway, 48 inches in, cir in circumference. And that was blown in a single breath of air by the glass blower. From and my anemic fishbowl is in my right hand, and my mom's fishbowl is in my left hand. But from that day on, there were no rules about not going out to the reef. I would hang out at the, at the boat ramp like a poi dog hangs around a luau. <laughs> and I not only wanted to go out to the reef, which, which was forbidden, I wanted to go beyond the reef. So that then led me to <clears throat> moving to Midway, I mean to uh, Oahu, and <coughs> excuse, excuse me, and uh, and that's when I took up surfing. And surfing was a very important part of my life because it supplanted the adrenaline rushes I needed from disarming uh, armament. <laughs> and then my parents had this idea, and they said well, you should go to Punahou uh, for high school. And that was the real long shot. <clears throat> and so they, they prepped me for the exam and the interview. And then as, we, uh, as I went into the interview with Tom Medcalf, I learned the most important thing in the interview than I learned in all of Punahou. Because he sat me down and he asked one question during my Punahou interview. What are you most passionate about? Surfing. My mom almost fainted. <laughs> when I came out and I told her, <coughs> she said, how did your interview go? <coughs> I said, great. All we did was talk about surfing. <laughs> but what I learned was, if you're passionate about what you believe in, or what really drives you, there will be a place that will welcome you, nurture you, and enhance you. And that's why I wear my Punahou colors today. <laughs> I always get choked up when I talk about Punahou. <laughs> so then after Punahou, <clears throat> I got two degrees in, in business. But I went in the oceanography program, logical sense. And then the University of Southern California, where I work, said, you need <clears throat> more skills in your uh, background. So I decided to use the Punahou theory and apply it to the graduate school of MIT uh, in, in engineering. <clears throat> they looked at my record. No physics since Punahou, where I got a D. <laughs> no calculus since Punahou, where I got a C. Never took an engineering course in my life. They said, you're not qualified to get in. They told me if you did get in, you'd never graduate. And then they said, we'd like to have you just the same. Again, <clears throat> if you're passionate about what you believe in, there are places that will welcome you. From MIT, five years later, I in developed the company that set eight technical world's records for the conversion of sunlight to electricity, of which uh, the major one uh, lasted for 24 years. And I won that job by bidding four times what the Department of Energy said they had in the budget. So I thought beyond the reef. I was unbridled. 
what I was passionate about, I <coughs> strove to do. So now I find <coughs> at um, University of Southern California in La Jolla, where the only occupational hazard is kissing the ground every day and getting chapped lips. <laughs> but it is the most progressive campus in the world. We have uh, the energy diet of an, about a 90,000 person community and uh, we self-generate 92% of our own power. And so we have been incubating <laughs> technologies like you see here from Soytech, which now has uh, 300 megawatts of uh, sales for their product. That's equivalent of uh, about one-third of a nuclear power plant. In addition to that, we uh, also have over one megawatt of solar on our rooftops. For those of you who haven't been hang gliding over the campus lately, this is what it looks like. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> down at our Point Loma wastewater treatment plant, uh, they are flaring methane, surplus methane, into the atmosphere like a big lighter. And as a consequence, uh, we decided to stop that flaring, entered into a partnership and built a purification plant, injected it into the pipeline, and that methane now supplies 10% of our total campus demand by a fuel cell that does it through electrical chemical conversion rather than combustion. Ten percent of a community that has a diet of 90,000 people in energy fits on the footprint of a tennis court. We're also into creating bioalgae in which we will take algae, non-feedstocks, for food sources and turn it into diesel. In addition to that, we are looking to electrify our fleet using not so much plugging into the local utility, but using renewable energy. Because then and only then will you truly achieve zero type of uh, tailpipe emissions when your source of electricity is renewable rather than from your local utility. So that brings us home, and as Elizabeth Lindsay so perfectly set up today, finding your way home. And that's what I'm doing here now in Maui in <clears throat> to sh share with you three of those w things of finding my way home. The first is with Maui College and the community of Maui using <clears throat> the wind energy that is generated on the island. It's currently curtailed at night because there's not enough demand. How do you solve that? You create more demand. How do you create more demand? You bring electric vehicles to Maui. How do we bring that? We have the uh, rental car companies who are fleet buyers make available uh, electric vehicles and so they are conveniently housed overnight at a convenient place for charging. And rental car companies turn over their fleet about every 18 months, so when they have a used car, it goes out to an audience where you get to buy a secondhand, nearly, nearly new electric vehicle. And then we get charging stations, and then the local public begins to see more places at golf courses, hotels, shopping centers, restaurants, etc., and the momentum is growing. This was a new idea with Maui College and Clyde Sakamoto in June. In September, we got a $300,000 grant to make this happen. In December, this project was named the number three most innovative electric vehicle project in the country. I, I returned to uh, Midway this past March, uh, four days after the tsunami struck, and, and my house was not impacted. It has been put in the National Registry of Historical Sites. Some say because of the famous architect Albert Kahn that designed it. Some say it's because it, it survived my childhood. <laughs> but what I found there was most disturbing. 
And then that is the proliferation of plastic in the oceans that has now thread the eye of the needle constantly and a proliferation of plastic. And so Midway is just like a one tooth in a comb of the oceans. And here is something dramatic. The carcass of a goonie bird. Stomach filled with the ingestion of plastics over time. And this too is a major project that I shall be working on. And in addition to that, the fishing nets that are afloat and the consequences it plays with the wildlife of the sea. Thirdly, my way home, and I wear the double hook of the wayfinder today with pride. These folks who go and sail the Pacific in Polynesian voyagers are my, are my, my new icons of sustainability. The Pacific voyagers who are currently wintering in San Diego sailed from New Zealand, South Pacific, Hawaii, San Francisco, down to San Diego. 10,000 miles, six months, seven vessels, 100 people, zero fossil fuels. <laughs> and it's a pleasure that, and, and I thank Kimo Keo for all of his generosity and all that everybody on Maui here does with uh, Pacific Voyagers. And this is a shot of them sailing to the bridge, sailing as a fleet uh, underneath the uh, Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And now, <clears throat> this will be my toughest part of the speech. I'd like to introduce you to Sonny Washam who, at the age of 18, for Christmas vacation a year ago, returned to northern Uganda to whew, help bring the end to the longest-running armed conflict of 22 years in all of Africa. I'd like to introduce you to Navy Ensign Spencer Washam, who just finished his survival training program on his way to becoming a naval flight officer to serve our country. I started the speech by saying, the, dedicating to the, to the uh, teachers, the educators, and the parents in, in the group. Uh, my point is this, encourage your children in your life to go out on the end of the branch and when they get there, jump up and down till it almost cracks. Because life and service and society is all about living beyond the, beyond the reef and the joys that it brings. Thank you very much. <laughs>